You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, believe it or not, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is the draft. It's obviously going to be very late, so we are going to have this episode and one more episode before the actual draft comes out. Speaking of, um, as far as other shows, Clayton's show at uh, Packer Total, Packers Total Access was supposed to be out by now. Having a lot of technical issues trying to get that audio just to work. I'm, I'm actually star- staring at it right now, trying again to get it to upload. So um, I don't exactly know when that will go live, but i um, doing everything I can to make sure that that gets up because obviously everybody that's on the network that's doing these shows is putting a lot of work in. And um, so we got to make sure that we get that up. But on the docket, we do have at noon today the final... Um, pre-draft mock draft show and I say final because it's the final one that I know of we'll see if they want to do like a reaction show or something um but that'll be going live at noon central today you've got uh, JJ's show over at Cheese and Packers is coming out tonight for the afternoon show and then tomorrow morning obviously you will have me again pending any massive issues which there shouldn't be because I took the day off so I don't know what could possibly go wrong the end of the world maybe to stop me from doing a show um but that's the lineup we've got a lot of stuff coming out for you guys and and yesterday we had another one come out um two round mock draft I just started that this morning because even I can't even keep up with my own network there's so so many shows coming out but I'm just getting caught up here I'll finish that one on the ride into work Excited to see what the boys had to say about uh, what's going to happen. And to be honest, that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I'm not doing a mock draft per se. I So I did over at the old Substack. Thank you very much to Brady, by the way, for signing up for that. Um, I've got some ideas for what I'm going to do next. In fact, I worked on a really big project, and I just I got up in my own head about why it doesn't work. I, I had some really good data, and I was like, hmm. But that's a little inaccurate because of this. And then I start getting up. I I just I do this every time. Like, yeah, but technically and kind of and sort of. And I ended up just deleting the whole thing. I don't know why I did that. I'm so like you could have just left it. It's still good information. And then maybe start a second one or add to it or do something. Nope. I just deleted that whole thing. (laughs) But it was about draft value. I wanted to see how how good of a job the Packers have done drafting recently. I looked at 2000 to 2018. I had the best draft pick in that entire span. I found the worst draft pick. Everything in between. The best Packers non-quarterback draft pick. Spoiler alert. Aaron Rodgers. Depending on, you know, after I tweak a couple things and redo it, but uh, Aaron Rodgers, the best draft pick. Bad audio again. The stupid, it will not upload. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with this podcast. Um, The best draft pick. When you factor in the value of the player and where they were picked, Aaron Rodgers, number one. I'm not going to tell you who the best non-quarterback is because I doubt anybody will guess it. But if you want to take a couple swings, I'll probably do that again and then post a couple questions on Twitter and see who can get it. Also, who the worst pick it was. That's probably pretty easy to figure out. Well, not easy, but I mean, if you dug around, you could probably find it. Um, Best non-Packers, best non-quarterback for the Packers. Another one you could probably guess. But anyways, um, again, there's the issue with it is there's just not enough picks, man. And, the, the you know, if you look at 20, I mean, even in 2010, there's still players that are still playing. So looking at, you know, how valuable a player is overall, it's like, well, some of these guys aren't done. And if you go back too far, you go into the 90s, it's like, yeah, but things were different back then. So there's not like a reliable range where you could say from here to here, it's You know, we're talking about the same values, but also guys whose careers are completed. It's like, okay, but that's a really small sample size. We're talking about like eight years. So I got to kind of figure out what I want to do. Probably the best thing to do would be to stop being so um, persnickety and just, you know, whatever. But anyways, um, working on a lot of that stuff. That's been a lot of fun. Um, Value of picks overall. 
right? What is the what is the value of the number one overall pick? What is the value of the number fourteen overall pick? A couple other quick observations. Again, we're gonna end up tweaking some stuff, but basically, the number one overall pick is by a billion light years ahead of every other pick, probably because it's usually quarterback. Which my first thought was, well, that's skewing it, but it's not skewing it. It basically shows you if it's the number one overall pick, you should be taking a quarterback. In fact, if you're not taking a quarterback, a pass rusher, or maybe a tackle, you're just wasting all of your time. Bad pick. Don't care who it is. Bad pick. Which, again, it's one of those things you play with the numbers and you look at it and go, oh, that's why stuff like that happens. Right? Quarterback, pass rusher, more or less, with the first pick. If you're doing something else, you messed up. Historically speaking, you already lost that, that pick. The top five. There's something weird about the top five because after the top five, huge drop off. Right, one down to two, and then two through five, and then plummets. And from there, it's from six to thirty-two, really slow, really gradual fall off. Like the difference is not as drastic as you would think. So if you're picking at like nine, your team sucked, and you don't really get as much value from that as you know being like a playoff team, benefiting from that, feeling good about that, enjoying your season, and still getting decent enough players. Obviously, the guy at number nine is probably going to be better, but I'm just saying it's not as big of a plummet as you would expect. But anyways, um, I guess before we officially get started with the what the heck is going to happen in the draft thing that we're going to talk about, um, the Darren Waller thing seems more and more like something we probably shouldn't worry about. Um, Again, the question was between, on one hand, the uh, Raiders, which we got further confirmation, a source talked to somebody else. This is somebody within the Raiders organization and basically just said what um, Derek Carr said, which is LOL. That's a complete joke. And so I, I guess the confusion was how is it a joke if you guys were going to offer him in a trade earlier on? Right? It seems like at one point you were interested, and that's what Aaron Negler said in his response video. But I want to clarify one thing really quickly. If we go back to the article written uh, by Jeff Howe, the one that I referenced yesterday, I want to read this to you just to kind of point out something a little bit more specific. So it starts off, or at least this is where I'm going to start reading. The Packers wanted the first and second round picks in 2022 that they ultimately received. That was initially what the Packers wanted. But the Raiders are hoping to substitute that second rounder for another pick. So maybe a 20 43 second, or maybe a third, or a third and a fourth or something. They didn't want to give up their second, but that's kind of where they were at. Then it says, the deal nearly hit a snag when the Packers asked for a player in return. Initially, the Raiders offered their 2022 first round pick and a 2023 second rounder. Shortly thereafter, the Packers asked for a first rounder and an undisclosed player. We now believe that that player was tight end Darren Waller. Here's what it says, though. It doesn't sound like the Raiders were going to accept that package. But the sides also realized such a deal actually wasn't permissible as league rules don't allow a player to be involved in a trade for another player on the franchise tag. It didn't say they were about to agree. It said the Raiders didn't want to give him up. So in um, Aaron Nagler's response again, he said that he knows for a fact that the Packers were trying to go after Waller. But what we don't know is any confirmation whatsoever that the Raiders at any point were willing to give up on Waller. We have no information on that. And I know Negler is hinting toward, well, that's what I was told, but I don't think he's ever directly said that. And I don't think, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't think any of that ever happened. It just doesn't make sense. All the evidence is pointing toward the Raiders. I mean, again, in this article here, the Raiders didn't want to give up on Waller. Since Negler reported what he reported, Derek Carr said LOL, which again, doesn't make sense if they actually were. It doesn't. Because he wouldn't say that unless it was LOL. And then you have a Another thing on top of all that, which is the Raiders coming out, leaking it to whoever it was, basically saying, this is nonsense. It's never, we would never give up Darren Waller. It's not going to happen. So my final summary of this, the Packers did want Darren Waller. It says in this article, they wanted to get a player. I believe Aaron Nagler's source is correct that that player was Waller. I don't believe, I mean, it, it may also be true that they're still trying to get Waller, but I don't believe the Raiders have ever at any point entertained that, that offer. And I don't believe they're entertaining it now, and I don't believe that trade is actually going to happen. Maybe it will. Aaron is sticking to his guns, but it really sounds like there was never really very much here. Sounds like maybe either he got some slightly bad information, 
or maybe he misconstrued exactly what that information meant. But that's where we're at. I still find it interesting, though, the information that we were trying to get Waller. And I'm planning on releasing a uh, YouTube video pretty soon here. I'm trying to kind of get into the groove of this, I guess, weird sort of vision that I have that is probably stupid, but I really like it. So um, I'm going to try to see if I can upload a video that's in any way interesting. And if I can, then good. If not, then I'll, I'll give you my insights on it. But I do think it's interesting that we're headed in that direction. I do think it's a sign that we should keep an eye out for the Packers really heavily considering investing in a tight end. I think it's entirely possible that we would be drafting a tight end as early as the second round. I don't think they would do first round because I just don't know if there's anybody worth it. And plus the Packers, we know how they are with stuff. Even if they really, really want one, the Packers really, really wanting one means they want them bad enough to take them in the second round, (laughs) not the first round. But I could be wrong about that too. But it's just something to, I guess, keep an eye on. And if I were to try to hint it without giving away the whole video, I don't know that it's entirely possible to rebuild our offense the way it used to be because we cannot get a Devontae. There, that's, not a, that's not a plan, right? Maybe you get lucky and get a once-in-a-generation Devontae day one, but it's very unlikely. So is there a different way to build an offense that makes you a very good offense that isn't dependent on an elite star, you know, elite wide receiver or bust is not a plan that's going to work out. What else could we do? I explained what the Raiders did that was very successful. We know that they were t- targeting Darren Waller. We also know that they're looking for wide receivers with speed. Stitch that all together and there you go. Anyways, let's, uh, let's look at this. We're going to do, not again, not exactly a mock draft because I'm not making official picks, but I want to make general observations of the teams and um, how this all plays out in my head, at least where I'm sitting at this moment. Oh, they got a countdown timer on here. One day, 15 hours and 54 seconds. Ba-boom. But the one thing that I've come to realize about the draft, um, I, I, if you head over to the Substack, you can see my first pick. And my first pick is I have the Jacksonville Jaguars trading with the Detroit Lions for Aiden Hutchinson. This is what I would do. If I was in control of every single team, that would go down. Because if I'm the Lions, I want Aiden Hutchinson real bad. If I'm the Jaguars, I don't. I want to tackle. And if you read any mock draft out there, well, they're not going to do that because they paid a bunch of money for the offensive line. Right. Because the offensive line is, is, is a massive, if not the number one priority because of our quarterback. It still is. Here's the thing, though. What I've learned over the years um, of really being invested in the draft, especially early on, if not throughout the entire uh, first round of the draft, always expect the expected. It always ends up being the boring answer. Right. I, I always come into this going, that's not the right pick. Don't do that. You should trade it or you should go with this pick or you should go with that pick. And although it's not always guaranteed and there's been a couple surprises, your best bet is to go with the most boring answer. And and as I kind of went through it, I said, you know, I have a hunch. I just have a tiny little hunch that we've all been talking about how this is going to be the craziest draft and this is going to be we don't know what's going to happen. And it's really actually going to be kind of boring. The only real complication is what version of boring is it going to be? Because we still don't know, (laughs) right? But I think there's two very obvious answers at number one, Aiden Hutchinson and Trayvon Walker. I'm not talking about what makes the most sense. I understand that, that, you know, there's a lot of people, even myself included to some degree, looks at Trayvon Walker like, I don't know, dude, that seems like some smoke and mirror stuff. That dude was so bad in college. You can't project that hard at, at the first overall pick. I mean, literally, he was, he was flat out a bad pass rusher in college. He was just bad. He's playing at a major program. He has all the help he could possibly want. Everybody along that defensive line is a freak. And one of the freakiest guys is the guy that's still there and isn't coming out until next year. And he still couldn't get to the quarterback? That sucks. And he's the most, one of the more athletic guys in this draft? That's not good. So while I completely understand the whole, you know, well, we got to get a guy that we project can be this, that, or the other, and you want to swing for the fences and take chances, this just seems like a suicide mission. I mean, taking chances is fine, but... How much of a chance is too much of a chance? 50% chance of success, 25% chance, 10% chance, 5% chance. At some point, chasing that Hall of Famer is going to get you killed. And again, this is just me thinking here, rather than just taking the obvious answer and just just going with what the media has been telling you and they've been pointing you in a certain direction for a long time, go with that. And so I think I'm, I'm more heavily leaning Trayvon Walker, but I'm just taking you through my own personal thought process of why this is stupid. First of all, 
Again, offense is the only thing that matters. Your quarterback is the only thing that matters. Making him successful is the only thing that matters. You do nothing to help him with your first pick, and then you go out and get a developmental pass rusher that's going to suck in his first year. That's your big investment. Yeah, but in two, three, in two, three years, you're fired because this quarterback is going to be garbage. What does that matter? In year three, he's going to be really good. Wow. Dude, your team sucks right now, like real bad. You've had the number one overall pick two years in a row, and you're setting yourself up to go there three years in a row now because you got a guy that's not going to hardly contribute at all in year one. And who's this defensive guru that's going to help you figure this out? That's going to help him just like get on track. Don't do it. Trade out of the spot. However, I think they are going to do it, and I am leaning toward Trayvon Walker. Again, maybe it's all smoke and mirrors, and I know everybody's all up on the smoke and mirrors thing, but that's the thing. That's, that's me, and that's you thinking too hard. It always, it almost always ends up being the boring pick. And I remember almost every year I'm like, oh man, something crazy is going to happen. And then they pick the most obvious one. And I was like, oh man, they really did it. That's crazy. I can't believe they did what everybody said they were going to do this whole time. And then the second pick, oh man, they did exactly what everyone said they were going to do. That's crazy. And then, oh man, they also did what everyone said they were going to do. And then the Raiders take some like mid first round pass rusher at four who ends up sucking Cleveland Furl. Go figure. He's no good. So teams are like, yeah, don't do crazy stuff. Don't be stupid because it doesn't pan out. So I, I do think that's going to happen. And then, the, and then at pick two, it couldn't be any more obvious, right? So that, that's, the, that's the big letdown. If Trayvon Walker happens, it's like, oh, see, we should have known that was going to happen. Everybody basically told us, right? Well, and, and I understand a lot of people say, no, actually, Aiden is the more likely. Pr- Aiden is, is, like I said, I don't think it's 35% of the mocks have Aiden going number one. It's still the major or the plurality i guess but it's certainly not a wide margin and it's it's declining by the day and and every single article i've read you talks about how scouts are not that high on aiden hutchinson coaches are not that high on aiden hutchinson and they're drooling over trayvon walker and we know this is how teams are we know that they want the guy the wide receiver with speed the pass rusher with speed the guys with the traits are the ones that get everybody excited aiden hutchinson's just a dude right aiden hutchinson is Kenny Pickett. Aiden Hutchinson is um, Mac Jones. They might be the best in the draft, but nobody cares. Nobody wants them, right? Mac Jones was the best quarterback. We'll see what the, what the long-term return is on that, but seemingly that was the best pick. Where did he go? QB4? Why? Because he's boring. He doesn't, he doesn't have like that crazy throw-on-the-run stuff. He doesn't have the, the ability to run like Trey Lance and Justin Fields. Those guys are flashy, man. Justin Fields has a six-pack. You seen Mac Jones? Dude's got a keg. He just stands there and like throws to the open receiver and stuff like that's boring. What are you, Tom Brady? That's dumb. Nobody wants Tom Brady, dude. We want Lamar Jackson. (laughs) And that's what teams do. They'll pick Lamar Jackson over Tom Brady every time. That's why, despite the fact that Malik Willis is kind of just garbage, he's probably going to be the first quarterback to go. Maybe not. Maybe he ends up falling. I I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I bet he goes. I bet he goes way too early. Maybe it's kind of a Lamar Jackson thing where he does slide and he falls to the back of the first and somebody trades up and grabs him. I don't know. And by the way, if you're asking if I'm dogging Lamar, I am. He was terrible last year. He had one good year. He had a horrific rookie season, a dominant sophomore season, and then he was meh, pretty good, but clearly not as good. And then this past year, his backup was as good, if not better than he was. It was bad. He went out injured, and, and Ravens fans were like, it was a sigh of relief. Like, oh, thank goodness. Get this guy out of here. He's so garbage. So, yeah, I am saying that. And by the way, injured, which was the number one concern of a lot of people for a long time. The guy is, he's a runner, and he likes to run. And when you run a lot, you expose yourself to getting hit. And when you get hit a lot, you get injured. There's a reason quarterbacks can play until they're 45, because most of them just stand there and, and throw the ball and don't get hit very much. Certainly don't get hit while they're running. There's a reason running backs have a very, 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 very short shelf life. Because they run, and they get absolutely smoked. They get beat up real bad. They don't last very long. This guy's struggling as a quarterback and is already starting to take on injuries. Same with Kyler Murray. What's so good about Kyler Murray? He runs around real fast. What's the problem with Kyler Murray? He realized if he wants to get paid, he's got to be healthy, and he just stopped running. He stopped running. And by the way, when he did, he was terrible at it. Do you know where Kyler Murray ranked last year as a runner? 34th out of 38. That was his rushing grade last year. Terrible at it. He's fast, but I I tried to tell you guys last year when we played him, he's not a run threat. And I got mocked into next century. And guess what? He didn't threaten us on the ground at all. He didn't do anything with his feet. So now what is he? He's a guy that runs all over the place, but is trying to learn how to stand still and throw. Wow, that's a great asset. 
By the way, Lamar Jackson is a runner ranked 11th. Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, Andy Dalton, Justin Herbert, Tyler Huntley, Pat Mahomes, Zach Wilson, Jalen Hurts, Jamison Williams, and Josh Allen graded higher. That doesn't mean more athletic. I know, well, that's stupid. How could Tom Brady be higher? It, ju- it just means more effective. Doing more with what you've got. You run fast in a stupid direction doesn't help you. Kyler Murray scrambling around all the time and getting tackled 15 yards behind the line of scrimmage gives you a really bad running grade, even if you're really athletic. But again, all this comes back to the main point that it doesn't matter. The NFL just wants the freaks. They just want freaks. Trayvon Walker's the freak. I think he goes number one. And as soon as that happens, I'm going to roll my eyes. Because we, we're going to sit here and we're going to wait and we're going to wait and we're going to wait and we know what's going to happen. The Lions are going to take Aiden Hutchinson. It's like, okay, well, that, that was boring. This is boring. Uh, but any minute now, it's going to start to get exciting. Then you got the Houston Texans up. What would be the obvious pick for the Houston Texans? Well, who's the one guy that we've been hearing over and over and over and over and over again might actually be the most athletic, the best player in this draft, one of the, you know, whatever, guy that doesn't have any red flags, everybody loves him. It's also a big need for the team. How about Iki Ikuanu? You know, they got attacked. Well, they already got Laramie Tunsil, right? And everybody else sucks. Maybe they go edge rusher, but what, are they going to get Kayvon Thibodeau? Is that the number three guy? We sure about that? Maybe it's Evan Neal. I don't know. But again, th- this is kind of just how I see this going a little bit. It, again, at least early on. And at the very least, although we don't actually know, because with every pick, it could be one or the other, right? It could be Aiden goes one, and then, then it's kind of a question mark, but probably Trayvon Walker goes two. And then the Texans, again, are in the same spot. And I tend to think they go with one of the tackles, probably a Kemikwanu, but I guess I don't know for sure. But again, we're all excited. We're all waiting. We can't wait. Something crazy is going to happen. It's like, no, that was, that was kind, of, kind of expected, I guess. Then the Jets are on the clock, and there's going to be speculation. Maybe they go wide receiver. Maybe this is the moment something crazy happens. What's their biggest need? According to uh, mock, uh, NFL mock draft database.com, and I have my own opinions on needs, and I very rarely agree with these consensus things, but we're going just down, with, down the line, the most boring possible thing. Biggest need, cornerback. Potentially best available player, Sauce Gardner. Should we lock it in? Probably. Now, again, maybe they do go wide receiver. By the way, now would be a good time to uh, give you my other thought on this, as far as wide receiver. Knowing the NFL the way that I know the NFL, injury concerns and all, I think Jamison Williams is the first wide receiver off the board. I don't know that for a fact. I remember a report a long time ago that Garrett Wilson is, is the guy that everyone's gushing over. And again, that's the guy that I like. But that just makes too much sense to me. Garrett Wilson is just that guy that's just a good football player, right? But even if you, know, if you talk to JJ or any Ohio State fan, they'll say Olave was the more reliable guy on, the, on his own team. Olave is the better route runner on his own team. The guy the quarterback trusted on his own team. Not to say Olave goes first, but that's not necessarily the makings of a guy that you want to go as the first wide receiver going, you know, number four, number eight overall, number nine overall. That's not the guy you want to take there. And again, the NFL is obsessed, 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 obsessed with speed. And presumably, this is one of the best pure speed guys to come out in a long time. And I know every year they say that, but again, that one metric that I pulled out, that this is a guy who hit 1,500 yards, which is a heck of a benchmark that all these other speed guys did not hit, maybe this is the guy. Maybe teams genuinely believe this is the one. This is the one time we're going to finally say, this guy plays like Tyreek Hill, and he's actually going to be Tyreek Hill. I'm not saying I know that. I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying what I think NFL teams are thinking. NFL, I'm starting to think the NFL is, is worse than fans in terms of, like, you know, fanning. You know, Packer fans look at guys like Christian Watson, and they're like, oh, he's so tall and so fast. And, and you know, uh, me and some other people sit here and be like, yeah, I get it, but, like, calm down. That doesn't necessarily mean good football player. It just means you're tall and fast. I mean, if that's all you wanted, we would just draft track stars, right? There's, tra- there's people that run track that are faster than a lot of these football players. They're blazing fast. It's what they do. You know, you can go get Olympic athletes that make all these guys look slow, but they're not good football players, so it wouldn't do you any good. But the NFL, man, they're, they're the same way. They can't, they can't help themselves. They see it, and they believe in their abilities, which I guess is a good thing. If you're a coach, you should believe in yourself and your abilities, but you maybe do that a little bit too much. You believe in your abilities too much, and, and you think, I can turn this guy into... If I had a guy with those tools, I could turn him into the best in football. So I don't think he goes four, but I do think as we get closer and closer to that team that ends up taking a wide receiver, Jamison Williams is that wide receiver. I don't know that. And again, as we get further on down into the draft, there is probably a semi-boring answer, but you kind of get to the point where it's like, I really don't know. And it's going to be at least a little bit surprising. 
But Jamison Williams, let's just say eight to the Falcons if that happens. It's one of those things where it's like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. But at the same time, it's going to be, eh, I guess we should have seen that coming. Which to me is really all I'm talking about. I think this is going to be a, I, I shouldn't say I think it's going to be. I, I'm worried that all the hype that this is going to be an exciting draft class is going to lead to us going, it was not that exciting. Which doesn't mean we knew what was going to happen because we we don't have any idea what's going to happen. But there's still picks that you can make where you look at it and go, mm, yeah, I guess I get. I, we should have seen that coming. As opposed to, dang, I didn't see that coming, right? If 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 the draft goes as I said say it should, that would be shocking. Even to me, I'm not saying like I'd be the only one that expected it. I don't expect it. I expect it to not happen. If it does, it will shock me. Even though I think it's the right thing to do, I would be stunned. But again, every year I look at that number one pick and say, you should trade it, dude. You should just trade it. Take take the trade back. Take the compensation. It'll be massive. That guy that you want is not that good. Maybe last year I didn't say that because, I mean, Trevor Lawrence is freaking Trevor Lawrence. But in the past I have said that, and it never comes. It never happens. That trade banner never pops up. They end up making a pick, and it's like, all right, well, anyways, let's keep going. And it just does that for the first several picks. But then if you continue on after Ahmad Gardner, which again is like, all right, well, something cool is about to happen any minute now, you get the Giants. And the Giants have two picks in the next three. And I, I expect the Giants to be relatively boring. Now, they could surprise us, but I know they desperately need Ed Rusher. And the expectation is that they end up taking a tackle. I don't know if I necessarily would, but I expect them to. And so on the consensus draft, we'll skip over the Panthers. We have them taking Evan Neal at five, Jermaine Johnson at seven. I think it ends up being something like that. I don't know if it's Jermaine Johnson, though. And again, now we're kind of getting into interesting territory, but the only reason that's on the consensus is because Kayvon Thibodeau in the consensus board goes number two to the Lions, and I don't think that'll happen, which means Kayvon Thibodeau would end up being the pick for the Giants. And he's a, he's, I mean, he's, he's a good football player. He's a great fit. He's a, he's a true stand-up outside linebacker type of, of prospect. So again, that would be boring. Evan Neal at five. Kayvon Thibodeau at seven, possibly switch those around. I don't know. Probably not, though, because there's a lot of pass rushers. And outside of Evan Neal, unless you like Charles Cross, not a lot of great options. So again, Ahmad Gardner, boring. Evan Neal, oh, come on, man. Don't do this to me. Then you get, though, at pick six, the Panthers. And I don't know if there is a boring pick here. I mean, I I guess there is. But no matter what happens, I'm going to be a little bit surprised because the Panthers have this pick and then they don't pick again until the fourth round. The most obvious thing is they have to trade out of this spot. They absolutely have to. However, there's also that thought that says, you guys better get a quarterback here because you got a bunch of people on the verge of getting fired and you're not going to win with Sam Darnold. And then, just I think yesterday, a report came out that um, quarterback Sam Darnold was told that they may draft a quarterback. Now, I do think it's possible that's smoke and mirrors because I can see a path for that being smoke and mirrors but only if they're planning on staying and making a pick. Because the only reason you would do that, the only benefit that would be, and by the way, it wouldn't be that hard to just, you contact uh, your quarterback and say, just so you know, we're going to be leaking information that we're drafting a quarterback. It's not true. We're doing this to to get some really good capital. So you're going to hear some stuff. Um, just know that it's fake. Don't get all upset with me and demand a trade and everything else. Also, please keep your mouth shut about what I'm telling you, or I will cut you. Because, I mean, n- not from the team with a knife. With a, with a rusty knife. Do not tell anyone that I'm telling you this. But the only benefit to that would be you have a team try to trade up to get a quarterback to jump the Panthers because you want a player to fall to you. You don't do that because you want to trade. That doesn't make any sense. And people think that all the time. Like, oh, well, if you want to trade, you, you make it seem like you want a quarterback and then somebody offered you a trade. Why? Like, we want a quarterback. Okay. You want to trade with me? What are you talking about? I thought you wanted a quarterback. Well, I'm just saying. If you want him, maybe you should come get him because I'm going to do it. Okay, but if, but if you wanted a quarterback, you wouldn't trade, so I don't think you're going to draft a quarterback, right? That's stupid. I don't know. I really like him. He's going to be super great, but I, I mean, I'll give him up if you want me to. <laughs> yeah, you're going to give away a franchise quarterback just because, I don't know, I'm just feeling generous. Really want that extra second round pick. That's stupid. That doesn't make any sense. So if a trade happens, regardless, it's exciting, right? Trades are always exciting because you don't know exactly what's going to happen or who's trading up or what they're trading up for, right? Maybe somebody's trading up to the sixth spot to get ahead of the Giants to get a pass rusher. Maybe somebody's coming up to get that quarterback. Maybe somebody's coming up to get the wide receiver because they know uh, the uh, Falcons are sitting at eight. Maybe the Jets want to trade up. Maybe the Seahawks want to trade up. They want to get that wide receiver before the Falcons do. Maybe somebody's trading up to get the the wide. Either way, that's exciting. 
if they stay and pick a quarterback, that's still relatively exciting. If they take Kenny Pickett, if they take Malik Willis, I think it's stupid, but it's exciting, especially for Packer fans who really want to run on quarterbacks to get started. Is it maybe the obvious pick? Am I going to sit here and go, that makes sense? Maybe, but it, it just doesn't have that same feel to me. And maybe this is somewhat of a personal exercise. You know, what, what to you is exciting and what to you is kind of like, all right, that's, that's a little expected and boring. And if they stay and pick anything else, I just think it's stupid. If they sit here and pick a pass rusher or if they sit here and pick a wide receiver or something just absolutely ridiculous, I, I just don't think there's a good pick. I don't think there's anything that's valuable enough that I wouldn't trade back to try to get, you know, we still have a relatively early first round pick and we get end up getting a second and a whatever. So the good, the, the good thing about the Panthers pick is I don't think they can do anything that's going to be super boring. I mean, if, if they stick and pick, it, it can still be kind of boring, but it's because, you know, you're expecting something big, you're expecting a trade and nothing happens. So it's kind of anticlimactic, but it's still going to be somewhat surprising. Like, dang, that's, that was stupid, but uh, kudos to you for being an idiot. And then again, you get the Giants to come back around, probably taking a pass rusher because they desperately need one. If they didn't already, and if they did already, then they're probably taking an offensive tackle. If not, maybe they end up taking a corner. I think they could use that. Be a little bit of a, oh, that's, that's cool. Good, good decision, but not much of one. The Falcons are up next. The biggest needs they have, wide receiver and edge rusher. Now, the exciting pick here, take a quarterback. No matter what, if you take a quarterback in this class, it's going to be exciting. Sometimes quarterback isn't exciting because it's expected, right? When quarterbacks go early in most draft classes, when the quarterbacks are like the best prospects, it's expected. It's boring. We've been hearing about it for months and months and months and months and months. I'm doing mock drafts. I'll just, I'll just give you this spoiler. Malik Willis did not go in the first round. I just don't like him. And nobody went until pretty late in the, in the first round because I personally just I have no interest in him. So I think two quarterbacks went, and I don't think anybody went until at least mid-first. I don't remember exactly where the first guy went. But it took some time. So for me personally, again, if, if the Falcons end up taking a guy, if they, and he, here's the thing, he, as much as I don't necessarily care for Malik, there's a part of me that, that gets excited about those guys. Any, anybody that gets compared to Michael Vick, like I really liked Lamar. I did. I wasn't on the anti-Lamar bandwagon when he first came out. I mean, I, I knew that he's kind of those guys that rarely translate, right? Just like the, I don't like the speed guys because they very rarely translate at wide receiver. Right? There, there's all these like toolsy guys that always go early that rarely translate, like the super tall wide receiver. Same thing, right? You get the super tall guy who's a go up and get a guy but can't separate, and he ends up being not as good as everyone said he was going to be, and that's why I, I, I'm hesitant with Drake London. Even though he seems fine, even though I really like his tape, I just I put him in that box, and I can't not see him in that box. And so I can watch a guy like Malik and get excited, but there's that still that thing in my head that says these guys don't make good quarterbacks. And the thing is, if your ceiling is Michael Vick, that's still not that good. I mean, I, Michael Vick was exciting and he was a good quarterback, but we're not talking about Pat Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady. We're not, I mean, we're, we're not in that category. And if that's the ceiling we're hoping for, that kind of sucks a little bit. I mean, I would take it. And I'm sure the Falcons would take it if somebody told him flat out, like, this will be Michael Vick. Like, heck yeah, I would take him too. But I'm just saying that's, you know, usually if you're taking a guy, you're looking at a guy whose ceiling is Pat Mahomes because that's the new prototype. But again, quarterback would be exciting. And there, there is a part of me that sees that. And then you got Kyle Pitts and it's like, man, that could be kind of fun, man. That could be a fun offense. I mean, they're still going to suck for a while because everything else on this team sucks, but it'll be fun to watch. And, and there's nothing better than a team that's a lot of fun to watch, but still loses. <laughs> you know, Give me that team because then I'm not threatened by them. They're not going to knock us out of the playoffs. They're not going to beat us in the Super Bowl. They're no threat to us in the regular season whatsoever, but they're still fun to watch. Still got some good, good, fun, clean highlights. But again, what is the boring pick? And again, the cool thing is as we get further down, they're isn't really a super boring pick because things are kind of getting into the, I don't know what's going to happen. I think maybe the most boring pick would end up being edge rusher. Wide receiver, the only reason it's not boring, even though it's probably more expected, is because it's wide receiver and wide receiver always gins up a little bit more excitement. And there's the question of who goes first. And that's been a major question for wide receiver for a long time. So I think the, well, Garrett Wilson would be really boring. That's, that would be extremely, but if, if Drake London goes, if Jamison Williams goes, if Jermaine Johnson goes, pretty much any of these pass rushers, um, again, kind of the boring answer, but we're at the point where it's like, I don't know where we go from here now. Is there a surprise pass rusher? And I think there probably will be at some point, but who would that be? Then you get to the Seahawks. The most boring pick would be, assuming everything kind of falls the way we think it is, probably a guy like Charles Cross. 
right? They desperately need offensive line. They need a, a quarterback. But if, if this team is so stupid to put a quarterback behind this offensive line, they deserve everything that's coming to them. And by the way, this is one of the worst teams in football as far as their, their front office and their ability to build a roster. So it wouldn't even surprise me. Actually, I'm kind of excited because usually Seattle is at the back of the first round. And so they take really stupid picks, but it's like the back of the first round. So they kind of get a pass. I can't wait to see what really stupid reach they make in the top 10. You know, can't wait for him to take Darian Kennard, <laughs> Max Mitchell, Sky Moore. But then at 10, the, the Jets are back up, and um, probably the, the, the boring answer is wide receiver. Assuming they took Sauce Gardner first, they got their cor- corner back. According to this, edge rusher is the next biggest need. Edge rusher and wide receiver are kind of boring, right? And depending which ones are available, any one they take is going to be kind of, oh, that's interesting, but dang it. Dang it, because it's boring, and dang it, because we could have used either of those guys. So I'm not going to go through all 32 picks, because I think at this point, it you can't help but get a little bit exciting. By the way, anywhere Kyle Hamilton goes is going to be kind of exciting, just because we get an answer, right? He could go extremely, extremely early. He could also go very late. Do I think he could potentially be available at 22? I don't. I don't think there's a chance he slides that far. I could be wrong. But anyways, why don't we take a break here? Um, I've got a couple other thoughts on this draft, and then we'll, uh, and I guess we'll be done. But a um, couple things. We now have three GoFundMes, <laughs> because that's how I roll. We've had a, a big push, actually, in the last several days here for um, some of these things. So big shout outs. Drew is still trying to get some help with his seizure service dog. In the last five days, we had Jana give $25, Chris gave $100, James two days ago gave $40, and Wayne 14 hours ago, gave $100 to help Drew get a seizure service dog. We're up to $4,300 out of $7,440. He just updated that he um, took $50 off the total because he got a $50 in-person cash donation. So um, kind of working down from the other end as well. We're getting there. So we add in that $50, and we're talking in the last week. I can't see beyond five days, but 200 and let's see, 40, 90, 290 plus 25, 315. $315 he's received, which is pretty awesome. But you can find this uh, GoFundMe pinned to the top of my Twitter. And again, if you ever want any of these, try to reach out to me. Sometimes I don't see it. Just keep hitting me up. Sometimes I do see it and I forget to get back to you because I got a billion things going on at once. So just keep pestering me and I will get you the answer uh, eventually. And what I really need is a secretary. I, I just need somebody that can take all the stuff and just give me a calendar or something. I'll see if I can get one of my kids or somebody to do that. Maybe my wife will do it. I don't know. Just organize all this stuff for me and be like, hey, here's the list of stuff you still have to do. Because there's so many times I'm sitting there and I'm like, I know there's stuff that I was supposed to do and I don't know what. I have no idea. Um, Anyways, also pinned to the top of the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. And we've had uh, several more donations here. This is the Jamie and Carter Accident Fund. Wayne was also over here and gave $100. So we are getting very, very close to this. We're at $9,240 out of $10,000. So we need 760 more dollars, and we are completely and totally done with the Jamie and Carter accident fund. Uh, again, Jamie and Carter were hit head on and are recovering in the hospital and um, just trying to be able to help out, get Cody some extra money to help cover expenses as well as travel costs to travel back and forth to the hospital and whatnot. Uh, we're hoping they're doing well. But then I added our third GoFundMe. Um, it's kind of a long shot, but I did decide to go with the SIS thing. Bottom line. As I said, I can do a lot with the information over at SIS, but I cannot afford it. I can't pay for it myself out of pocket. It's, uh, it's, it's irresponsible. <laughs> it's what it is. But if the people listening to the show want those types of insights, which again, I'd be able to take this show to the next level to be able to get much better in-depth insights. Um, I now have a GoFundMe to try to raise the money for it. The total money needed is $1,400. I made it $1,500 because there's fees and whatnot. I don't know what those fees are going to be. So anything over and above, I will just give to the GoFundMe. I don't know. And if it ends up being short of 1400 after fees, I'll just make up the rest. I don't know exactly what this all comes out to, but I set it to 1500 If we get there, I will be buying SIS, and we are going to just absolutely shred this NFL season. So something to consider. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a big amount, but it's also one of those where if everybody gave a dollar, we're done. So thank you very much to Wayne, Kyle, John, and Brandon. We're up to $70 so far for donations. So again, that is also at the top of the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. If you want this, again, I can send you a link to it and we'll be ready to go. So anyways, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals. 
and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. All right, so a couple other thoughts and observations beyond the, um, the, the musing that I had that this is going to be a little bit more boring than we were expecting. Um, again, I mentioned Kyle Hamilton. Anywhere he goes is going to be exciting, and there's a couple other players that are like that, and I think some of these wide receivers are that way. Again, the boring thing is probably... Garrett Wilson, then Drake London, then Jamison, then Chris Olave, and then, you know, Traylon Burks goes, and then, you know, they maybe go before the Packers, although I'm starting to think Traylon's going to fall beyond the Packers, and I don't think they're going to take it. But again, that's kind of the boring layout. But I, again, my expectation is that it won't be boring. I think Jamison goes at, at the very least second. So it's kind of weird because the, the, the boring answer is also the one that I'm not really expecting. Again, the, uh, a couple other things as far as position quarterback. Anywhere quarterbacks go is going to be interesting and exciting, but the the worst possible option, as well as kind of boring because I'm sort of expecting it, is that the quarterbacks fall. And that's obviously very unfortunate for us because ideally there's a run, right? Ideally, quarterbacks start to go. I mean, the, the absolute best case scenario is the Lions take one at two. Not only is that unbelievably exciting, but it's unbelievably stupid, and it starts the run on quarterbacks really early. For three reasons, that would be the absolute best, most awesome thing in the world. Aside from the slight chance that he ends up being a stud and the Lions are a good football team, but I really doubt that would happen. But um, you've also got the Texans that could take a quarterback at three. You've got um, the Giants, probably not. They said they were committed to the guy they got, but who knows? It could be a surprise. You've clearly got the Panthers. You've got the Falcons. You've got the Seahawks. There's tons of quarterback needy teams. Washington, maybe, but I mean, they got a guy, but maybe they could pick somebody to sit a year and learn. The Vikings, probably not, but maybe. Texans again, the second time around. Eagles, I doubt it. Saints, potentially. In fact, I think this is where I had the quarterback goes to the Saints, because although that wasn't my intention, it was like, at this point, no quarterbacks are gone. I think you should strongly consider it. And then you've got the Steelers, right? So these are all the teams prior to the Packers that could use a quarterback, and hopefully many of them do. Again, wide receiver is kind of interesting, not just in how the first couple are sorted, but then there's also the question of these sort of second round guys, because it's kind of interesting how this, this whole thing is interesting with wide receiver, because everybody is so unbelievably different. It's not like you've got four Garrett Wilsons, and it's just a matter of like, you know, this guy's better than this guy's better than this guy's better than this guy. So you can rank them one through four. They're so unbelievably different. Right. And even the discussion I had with JJ about Garrett Wilson and, and his concerns with him, they're legitimate concerns. The thing you like about Garrett Wilson isn't there isn't another if we're talking Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Jamison Williams, Chris Olave, Traylon Burks, Jahan Dotson, George Pickens, Sky Moore, Christian Watson. And I guess we can throw in John Mechie. If we talk about these guys, there are not two guys that are the same guy. Maybe Chris Olave and Jahan Dotson are similar in terms of the style of guy that we're talking about. They're the only two that are in any way remotely similar. Smaller, faster route runners. I think people will take umbrage to that because they see Chris Olave as a more well-rounded, you know, um, true wide receiver. I kind of don't. But again, th- those are the only two that you could kind of say are similar. And so it, it's so unbelievably crazy to me 
that with all these guys that I listed, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten wide receivers, none of them are built the same. Maybe Mechie's kind of like someone. I don't know, Sky Moore or George. I don't know. I don't exactly know what John Mechie's supposed to be. But Garrett Wilson is sort of the, in, in a sense, he's kind of like a, a true number one wide receiver, but he's also not built like one. He's a little bit smaller. He's real smooth. He's a good route runner, but he's not the best route runner. He's real fast, but he's not the fastest. He's like a, 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 an X, but he's certainly not the best X, if you want to call it that. I think that's George Pickens. But he's maybe the best blend of all that stuff. Drake London, very obviously, is the big-bodied monster. And you could maybe say that's kind of like Traylon, but it's really not. They're very different. Jamison is the pure speed guy, just the absolute blazing, blinding type speed. Although there's fast guys, he's the guy that's fast on a different level. I personally don't see that on film, but I, I told you already, I can't gauge speed on film. I don't know how to do it. I'm watching it going, yeah, he's running past guys. Every, I've watched every single one of these wide receivers run past guy. I see George Pickens run past guys. I don't understand. But again, that's that. I'm just trusting what everyone's saying. This is different kind of speed. Fair enough. Again, Chris Olave seen as like a, a real solid number two wide receiver. He's got speed. He's got really, really good route running, real solid hands, really smart, developed receiver, but just probably not going to be your number one. He's too small. Traylon Burks is that run after the catch guy. Throw it to him behind the line of scrimmage and let him let him make magic happen. He's the guy you you scheme a bunch of gadgety stuff to because he just does. He's a, he's a running back. Jahan is kind of like every Penn State State guy. He's the guy that I I although I'm I'm not big on Jahan. I I actually watched him the other day. I don't know if I told you this, but it, I think I did. It was the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life. They they never threw to him. He was very rarely open, which I I don't know. People, people gush over him as though he's the best wide receiver in the class. He's just small, but I, I don't know. I watched two games, and I didn't see him do a single thing. But he is that, that guy that's, what is the guy's name? He's KJ Hamler for me, right? He's, he's, he's the guy that's smaller, faster, and shiftier that just seems like he's always open because he's just quick. But for some reason, and I to this day cannot understand it, doesn't translate to the NFL. I don't know why. Being super blinding fast in and out of your routes doesn't get you open in the NFL, but apparently it does. I think it has to do with size. I really do. I think it's just these guys are so big, they just push you around all the time, knock you off your routes, and take that into account with the speed of the NFL. And, you know, those, those, those gaps in zone are real tiny, man. They can close those real fast. But then you got George Pickens. And George Pickens is sort of the opposite of all these guys. All these guys have like elite traits in like one or two, but then they struggle in other areas. To me, George Pickens is the guy that's just like the most well-rounded, does everything, right? He's, he's plenty fast. He's plenty big. Fantastic hands. He's got that alpha number one mentality. I mean, for, for me, if, if you told me to just pick any guy out of this list to just be your number one wide receiver, I honestly don't know if I don't pick George Pickens. I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. I just have very few concerns about him and his ability to be a great wide receiver. Now, there are off-the-field character issues for sure, but that's a separate issue. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about playability, play style. I don't know that he's not just the guy. I know he's not as fast as Jamison. I know he's not as big as Drake. I know he's not as, as strong as Traylon. I know he's not as good of a route runner as Chris Olave. I know he's not as smooth as Garrett Wilson. I know he's not as great out of his breaks as Sky Moore. I know he's not as freaky as Christian Watson. I don't care. Because if you put all these traits together in a, in, into one package and then just lessen everything, he's, he's, he's not elite anywhere, but he's great everywhere. I just, I don't know. That's, that's just my guy. But again, there's the character concerns. There's the fact that he's not a freak. Does, he, does somebody really love him and he goes mid to semi-late first round? Does he go in the second round? Does he go late second round? Sky Moore, flying up the boards, could easily be a first round pick at this point. Christian Watson, based on his measurables, could easily be a first-round pick. John Mechie could surprisingly be a first-round pick. So of these 10 guys at the very least, again, the most boring is you get Garrett, then Drake, then Jameson, then Olave, then Burks, then Dotson, then Pickens, then Sky Moore, then Watson, then Mechie. And, it, it, you know, a couple little shuffled around things, but generally if it goes the way the mock drafts have been going, that's boring. But it almost seems impossible that that happens, doesn't it? It seems impossible to me. That's something crazy because again, it's so dependent on, it's not similar types of players that have varying degrees of how good they are. They're vastly different. And, and this was actually one of the more fun things to do in my mock draft was projecting wide receivers to teams because you really just dig into what does this team need? And they need vastly different things. You know, you, you might have the next guy up is Drake London, but you're looking at a team that is like, I think I was looking at the Jets and they've got just a bunch of big dudes. Everybody there's a monster. Everybody's like six foot three. 
One of them's like, I think Mims is 6'3 and runs like a 4'3'8. So I don't need a 4'3 guy and I don't need a 6'3 guy. I need a good wide receiver. I need a guy like Garrett Wilson. You got other teams uh, like Washington where it's like, we've got speed. We've got good wide receivers. We don't really have any size. Give me Drake London. We got other teams where it's like, we don't really have anything or maybe we're lacking speed. Give me Jamison Williams. We've got some other teams that maybe could use like that, that, uh, a little bit of extra, a little bit of something, something for our offense. We don't really have a slot guy. Give me Traylon Burke. Gives you that little extra something, a little bit more excitement to your offense, another dimension to your offense. So it's not just about who's the next best wide receiver. That's ridiculous because it completely depends on what your team needs. And depending on what your team needs, Drake London could be completely useless or he could be the most valuable wide receiver on this board by a mile. If you're like the Packers and you just need a number one guy, I don't really want Chris Olave. I don't really want Traylon Burks. I don't want Jahan Dotson. I'm not sure I want Sky Moore, but I probably want Garrett Wilson. I maybe want Jamison Williams, depending on what I think about him. I maybe want George Pickens, depending on his off the field concerns. Drake London, probably, maybe. Again, it all depends on what you actually think of these guys. But again, there's certain guys that fit. And then it comes down to what style do you want? Like, so, so now we're looking for number one. You got Garrett, you got Drake, you got Jamison, you got Pickens, maybe Sky Moore and Christian Watson. Then you kind of break it down to, okay, well, what are you looking for? Well, the Packers, they want a number one guy, but they also got to have some speed. Okay, well, we'll take Drake off the board and mm, pr- maybe Sky Moore off the board. So we got Garrett, we got Jamison Williams. I don't know if George has enough speed, but we'll say he does. And we got Christian Watson. Then it comes down to who do you actually like? Maybe we don't think Jamison is a true number one, so we take him off even though we love his speed. So we got Garrett, we got George, but maybe we don't like Christian Watson. He's not good enough. All right, so we're down to Garrett and George. Well, I don't like George Pickens off the field concern. So for the Packers, you got Garrett Wilson circled, massive need, mm, that's about it. And that's the thing. If we knew all that information, you're looking at that going, yeah, they're trading up for Garrett if they can. But, but there's so many, but every team has those same questions. We, we really want a compliment that is a really good slot guy. Okay. Probably don't need Garrett, don't want Drake, don't want Jameson, would love Chris Olave, would love Traylon Burks, would love Jahan Dotson, don't want George Pickens, would love Sky Moore, don't really want Christian Watson. All right, so now we got these guys. Okay, what's, what kind of guy are you looking for? We want a big slot. Okay, well, then I probably don't want Jahan or Chris Olave. Not sure if Sky Moore qualifies. Probably not at 5'10", 200. I mean, two, I mean, well, I guess 195. 200 is decently sized. He, he plays big, but I, if you're talking big slot, he probably doesn't fit. So I'm probably looking at a guy like Traylon Burks. So that, that's the part that's exciting to me about the wide receivers, is it would be surprising if it just goes in a normal order, because they're, it's not just ranking wide receivers. It's not just best, second best, third best, fourth best. It's They're all sort of the best in their own category, because they're all in different categories. The question isn't, which one is the best wide receiver? The question is which position they're all, you can almost think of it as they're all different positions. And the question is what position do the teams need the most? You know, I mean, if, if you're a team that has a really good number one and you're trying to find a really good compliment, Chris Olave is circled exclamation point, underline, underline, underline. And if you're that team picking at 12, who's to say you don't take Olave at 12? Well, he's not, Jamison Williams is better. Right. But I, I'm not looking for that. Maybe James Williams would be the, the better number two. Maybe Drake London's a better number two. I don't know. But again, it's just what you're looking for. And depending on what you're looking for, again, who's to say Traylon or Chris Olave or, uh, you know, Sky Moore or Jahan Dotson or whatever doesn't go way earlier than we thought. So I, 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 there is a way that wide receiver ends up boring because we've seen a million mock drafts and they all kind of go the same way. Garrett Wilson goes early. Drake London goes early. Jamison Williams goes early. And by early, I mean somewhere between, you know, six and 15 ish. Then you got the guys that go from like 16 to the end of the first round, which is Chris Olave and Traylon Burks. Maybe Jahan or George or Sky or Christian Watson slip in there. Maybe they don't. I don't know. And then you got the second round guys, which end up being, you know, Jahan ish, George Pickens, Sky Moore, Christian Watson, John Mechie, those kinds of guys. Tend- that would be kind of the boring layout. But again, there's a part of me that says, I doubt it. And if we're just talking first round, I, I would be stunned if one of these guys doesn't go in the first between Pickens, Sky Moore, Christian Watson, and maybe even John Mechie. I would also be a little bit surprised if uh, between especially Traylon Burks and Jahan Dotson, maybe one of these guys doesn't go in the first round. Jahan with his size could be a serious concern to where he's more of a second round guy. Traylon Burks would be a little surprising because it just takes one team to fall in love with him, which I'm sure there is someone. But I think there's plenty of concern with Traylon Burks that he might fall out of the first round. Outside of that, there's probably not a ton of guys that could come into the first round. Uh, Calvin Austin here is the next listed. Alec Pierce has that potential, maybe. 
just because, it, I mean, he's he's got the size, he's got the speed, he's got pretty much everything. He's he's probably a little bit more developmental, but what he can be when you develop him, I mean, he's he's a rare, special kind of a guy. But uh, I, I doubt David Bell, although the film guys will say he's the best wide receiver in this class just based on his film and his ability, but that, that combine stuff is going to crush him to the point where he'll end up going second or third round just based on it. I shouldn't even say that. But he, he probably will based on that. But he, he, he's got to fall because of his, his measurables. He just has to. Um, tight end is completely under the radar. Um, I, I don't know why it's impossible Trey McBride goes in the first round. I just, I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm conceding the fact that it won't happen. But I don't know why it won't happen. I mean, just based on his, his measurables. I mean, I, again, for the Packers, if we're talking about really wanting Darren Waller, why don't we want Trey McBride? And, and all these tight ends are fallen just tremendously. Trey McBride is the only second round guy. The next is Greg Dulcich, who's sitting at 75. Then Ruckert is at 88. Then likely is at 92. Like we're, all, we're way down there already. And it's just strange to me because, I mean, maybe they're just horrible tight ends in general, but these are, these are some of the most athletically freaky tight ends we've ever seen. And that's so unbelievably valuable. And it's like everyone just kind of doesn't care. As far as offensive line, again, there is a boring way that this goes, and that is kind of similar to the way the wide receivers are. You got Akema Kwanu, Evan Neal, then you got Charles Cross, then Trevor Penning, Tyler Smith kind of maybe sneaks in there, and that's about it. Bernard Raymond maybe sneaks in there. Um, but I personally have some questions. I think the biggest question mark is Tyler Smith, who's been flying up the boards. Could there be a shock of Tyler Smith going real early? Trevor Penning, I think, is a is a really interesting prospect that should go earlier than, than, I mean, he's, he's projected 17 overall. We've already heard he won't make it past 14. Maybe that's not true. I don't know, but that's, that's the consensus. But on top of that, Trevor Penning, especially if you're looking for a right tackle, which there are several teams who have pretty good left tackles, but could really use a right tackle, just a mean, physical, imposing plug and play right tackle. I, I think, I think you got a guy by the name of Trevor Penning. Obviously, the other big question for us is, does he fall? And if so, does he make it to us? And if so, do we take him? Personally, would I? Of course I would. Um, interior offensive line, big questions with Tyler Linderbaum. I personally think he should go real early, but I doubt he will. That seems to be the consensus now. Again, that would be the exciting thing. Not good for us, because I kind of want him, but um, exciting. Zion Johnson, Kenyon Green. Again, the, the boring thing that could happen, they go late first round exciting thing that would happen they go real early and i I'll, I'll, let me put it this way the consensus big board has tyler linderbaum 24 zion johnson 26 Kenyon green 27 i would be stunned if one of these guys doesn't go like in the teens i don't know which one probably tyler but i would almost be stunned if somebody isn't gone by 19 these guys are really really good in their own way and i know their interior offensive line but there are plenty of teams that need offensive line help and especially with the tackles being so like meh, at this point these are great options with very little question marks compared to the tackles. These are not small school, 25-year-old, like, you know, converted tight ends. These are established, brute, freak, interior offensive linemen. Um, other questions. Defensive line. Massive question, especially with the top two Georgia guys, Jordan Davis. Jordan Davis could go top 10. I don't think it'll happen, but that would be shocking, surprising, and exciting. The boring thing, Jordan Davis goes in the mid-teens, because that's kind of expected. But also, could he fall? Could he make it to 22? Would the Packers take him if he makes it to 22? I know Sam Holman would have an absolute meltdown. <laughs> he would completely lose it. I tell you what, we gotta, we, if, if Sam can't um, join us for the, the stream in its entirety, we got to at least have him on standby. So if Jordan Davis goes to the Packers at 22, or maybe just doesn't go, I don't know, we, we got to have him ready to, to jump on real quick. Uh, Devontae Wyatt. I, I, I still think Devontae Wyatt is one of the best prospects in this entire class. However... Serious off-the-field concerns and his age are problems. I'm sure there's other questions as far as production and, and the system he was in and having Jordan Davis and another freak next to you and a couple freaks on the outside of you and everything else. Everybody on that team is a freak, so how much did that just kind of inflate your ability? I don't know. But we know he's a massive freak, and we know that he's incredibly talented. So, I mean, Devontae Wyatt could go stupid early. I think just based on talent... If you remove age and off-the-field concerns and every other kind of concern, he's easily a top-10 pick. Would somebody take a flyer on him? Would he go in the teens? Is he going to end up going in the 20s where he's projected, 25 overall? Could he fall out of the first round because of those concerns? Age, off-the-field, etc. Travis Jones, I kind of expect to be a second-round pick, but that's another guy. Could he possibly go in the first? Logan Hall. 
both of those guys, either of those, I would say Logan Hall is probably more likely to go in the first, just based on what the what the NFL likes, which is guys that are pass rushers. And Travis Jones, although he's good for his size, is not really a pass rusher. He's a run defender that's better than average at pass rushing, considering he's a nose tackle. Logan Hall's a pass rusher. I don't think anybody else really has a shot at going early, aside from some really crazy non... If Seattle was at the back of the first, I'd say maybe. But DeMarvin Leal, Perry, and Winfrey, I don't really think any of those guys are going to make it. Um, Edge rusher, we talked about a couple of these guys. Where the first three go, especially, is going to be interesting. That's, these are kind of the tone setters. Aiden Hutchinson, Kayvon Thibodeau, Trayvon Walker, these are the guys that kind of set the tone for, I mean, just the, just how the draft is going to start. Again, if it goes Trayvon and Aiden, or even Aiden and Trayvon, it's kind of like, all right, this is kind of, it's kind of a boring start. Hopefully it gets better. But there's still a question of, of Kayvon. This is a guy that could go as early as number one. And depending on concerns, could maybe fall out of the top 10. So anywhere from 1 to 12 is his range. Probably going to be somewhere between, you know, 3 and 7-ish. Jermaine Johnson, massive question. Some people love the guy. He could potentially go extremely high, way higher than anybody expects. He could also fall, depending on what teams think of him. George Karloftis, same exact thing. We're now starting to hear rumors about him falling, potentially out of the first round. But this is also a guy that could potentially be a top 10 pick. And again, this is what's always been exciting about this draft is that you have these wild speculations about these about these players. But there still is a boring scenario in which George Karloftis goes somewhere between like, you know, 12 and 20. It's kind of like, you know, that makes sense. Jermaine Johnson goes between like 8 and 15. Yeah, okay. All right. Again, if it, if it follows generally, if the, if the draft looks like what we've seen from mock drafts for the last several months, it's boring. Exciting is Thibodeau falls out of the top 10. Jermaine Johnson goes top five. Karloftis goes top 10. Karloftis falls into the 20s or or outside of the 20s. Then you've got the second round guys, kind of like wide receiver. Could any of these guys go round one? David Ajabo, despite the injury concerns, lots of love for that guy, but injury concerns. Boy Mafe, Arnold Ebicati. Maybe there's another guy because there's other, I mean, pass rusher is a premium position and there are different flavors of guys. Nick Benito, very different style. And if people fall in love with him, he could go round one. He's projected 58th overall. I don't think it's impossible. Cam Thomas, Drake Jackson, Josh Paschal. And then you got MyJ Sanders and Kingsley and Igbare, who are projected to be like third round picks. But some of the better true pass rushers in this entire draft based on statistics. I mean, statistically speaking, these are two of the best guys. I'm not saying I think they can go first round, but I mean, if you want to get super crazy with it, something to think about. Linebacker, Devin Lloyd, one of the, you know, he's, he's expected to be one of those guys. Is there a shocker that involves Devin Lloyd being a top 10 or top 12 prospect? I hope so. N'Kobe Dean, same thing. Quay Walker, another guy that's flying up the boards that people, everyone is saying is underrated. Could he slide into the first round? Now, again, the boring thing, Devin Lloyd goes around 20-ish. N'Kobe Dean goes to the back of the first. Quay Walker's a mid-second round guy, along with uh, Christian Harris, Chad Muma, Leah Chanel, kind of in that range. But who's to say? Cornerback Derek Stingley is the main question mark. Derek Stingley has top five potential all day long. I mean, his, his upside is, un, I mean, there, there's, no, there's no top. He doesn't have a ceiling, but there are a massive amount of concerns. So where does Sauce Gardner go? Where does Derek Stingley go? Um, and then, you know, outside of that, you've kind of got the pile of Trent McDuffie, Andrew Booth, Kyer Alam, Kyler Gordon. Because I'm not big on corner, I want these guys to go early. I think there's a good chance Kyer Alam, spoiler alert for if I even do a what I think is going to happen mock, I think Kyer Alam is going to end up going to the Patriots. That just seems like a good fit to me, which is great because he's kind of seen as like an early second round prospect, but I just think that makes way too much sense. So if you got a Mod Gardner, Derek Stingley, Trent McDuffie, Kyer Alam all going before the Packers at pick 22, that's awesome. But you've kind of got that 22 to 28 range. How many guys go before? How many guys go after between McDuffie, Booth, Alam, and Kyler Gordon? And potentially a guy like Roger McCreary. Uh, if, you, if you're still on the booth of, or, or on the booth, I'm looking at Andrew Booth, if you're still on, in the camp of, I would be okay with a corner, then you might have different feelings about this. I, I just, I'm, I'm all the way out. This is a position I don't want. So let's get a run on cornerback going so that we can get some quality players pushed down to us. Because remember, the Patriots pick right before us. So if you've got Ahmad Gardner and Derek Stingley, which obviously they're going to be gone. But the big question is, can we get Trent McDuffie off the board and maybe force one more before we get to 22? That would be ideal for me. And then again, safety, which is, which is another really crazy one, because the, the, the first thing is, where does Kyle Hamilton go? In my what would I do mock, which again is, you know, if you want to go see it, 
You got to either be on Patreon or just go get a subscription to it. But I've got him going stupid early because I just I like him and I think he makes sense. But again, I don't think he falls to 22. So from from the Packers standpoint, it doesn't super matter. However, you've got Daxon Hill consensus 29, Lewis Seen 33, Jalen Petrie 45, Jaquan Brisker 51. I would almost be stunned if, let's say, by the conclusion of pick 22, one of these safeties isn't gone. I just think there are teams that need safety, that really want safety, that are going to really, 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 really like these guys. And and it kind of comes down to your your style of guy. Daxon Hill and Jalen Petrie are kind of similar. They're kind of those slot corner combo safety, whatever you want to call them, where they're, they're like slot guys that play uh, next most would be like free safety. And then after that, they're in the box. Lewis Seen is, like I said, like Adrian Amos, maybe the, the more kind of true safety, if you can put it that way. Jaquan Brisker is more of a strong safety. The majority of his snaps are in the box. Second most would be free safety, and then third would be slot. What do you need, and how much do you like these guys? And again, Daxton is getting so much hype. I, I would just be almost surprised if, if, again, by the conclusion of the Packers pick, which would include them, I think a safety should be off the board, one of these guys. The idea that Daxon Hill, Lewis Seen, Jalen Petrie, Jaquan Brisker are all still available after the Packers pick at 28, which is what this consensus says, I just don't, I don't see that happening at all. But again, who goes and where do they go? And, and maybe the more exciting thing is, what if three of these guys are gone by the time you get to 28? For, so from 22, so from the beginning all the way through 27, uh, who's to say Daxton, Lewis Seen, and or Jalen Petrie aren't gone? To have two or three of these guys off the board, which would be four... Uh, three or four in total with Kyle Hamilton. I would almost say you've got a, a, a safer bet with some of these guys than what you get with the wide receivers or the tackles or even the edge rushers. It feels like, you know, depending on if, if, if you need that particular skill set, the, the, these guys are just, I just have such a high confident level in them doing, assuming you're going to ask them to do what they're built to do, right? Don't ask Jaquan Brisker to be that, you know, safety slot hybrid. That's not who he is. Don't ask Jalen Petrie to be your, your strong safety. But if you take them, and have them do what they're built to do, what they do well, you're going to do just fine. So anyways, again, my, my, my biggest thought is that we're probably not going to be as shocked as we think. There's maybe going to be less trades than we were hoping. I hope that's not the case. I hope this is an extremely exciting and shocking and, oh my goodness, what is going on draft. Either way, it's going to be fun, but we will see. The, the, I guess the only remaining question that I would have is, if we're sitting there watching the draft, and regardless of how it's going, let's say the Packers flash on the board that they traded up, what did they trade up for? The one consistent thought I have, and again, it's not necessarily what would I do. It doesn't even necessarily feel like what the Packers would do, but there's just something that's just nagging at me that the Packers really want it, and I cannot get it out of my head, and I, I, you know, the, when I run it through the rational part of my brain, it's like, nope, that doesn't compute for what the Packers do but I can't get it out of my head. If Jamison Williams is still on the board and the Packers trade it up, I think that's the pick. Again, they, they, you know, they don't usually take wide receivers and I, he just doesn't feel like a Packers guy, although they said they wanted speed. I just don't know that it just doesn't feel right to me. But for some reason, I just can't help getting this thing out of my head that says they are obsessed with that guy. And although I don't think he's going to make it, again, I think he goes top 10, I mean, early. I think he's the first one gone. But I mean, completely honestly, could be gone at four to the Jets. I, I kind of think that's probably not going to happen, but I mean, that's that's how much I think that this Jamison Williams hype train is is ramped up. But if I'm wrong about that, and if he does fall, let's say, out of the top 10, and you see the Packers have traded up, let's say they package their, their first two picks or whatever, which again, technically could get us into the first 10 picks, I just cannot shake the, the, the feeling that the, the Packers would trade up for him. They've told us they want speed. They're desperate for it. If they think that he can be that, that, that X receiver, that number one guy, and also give them the speed, and again, maybe you pair that with a really good tight end somewhere along the line, heck of a one-two punch. Kind of working the levels, you know what I mean? Start with the run game, build on it with the tight end and, and the deep threat. It's a lethal combo, just saying. So again, I, I like 5% chance in my brain that happens, but I just, for some reason, I can't shake it. It just, I keep coming back to that over and over and over. It's like, it's like a daydream that I can't stop having. And every time I have that daydream, I think about it, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. That's not going to happen. But I, I just, I can't shake it. So if he falls, I'm going to be on the edge of my seat just being like, uh, if I see the Packers flash on the bottom of the screen, I'm going to freak out. But then the other part of me that knows the Packers always do things that I don't expect says, Jamison Williams is going to fall. The Packers are going to trade up. I'm going to say, dude, they're doing it. And then they're going to take like Tyler Smith, the, the tackle or something. <laughs>
So I don't know, man. All I know is tomorrow we're going to have answers. Tomorrow we're going to probably have two picks, maybe one. I don't know. And uh, bear in mind, we are going to be doing a live stream. So come on over, hang out. Not planning on anything super crazy. Just hanging out, watching the draft, man. Just having a good time. But I'll leave it at that. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.